Hello and welcome to this quick tip from BlenderCookie.com. My name is Kent Trammell and in this video I want to talk about brush textures, sometimes referred to as stencils, stamps, or alphas, uh, several different terms. And these are simply image textures that are plugged into Blender's brushes that can be used for texture painting and or sculpting. So to show you where brush textures are useful, uh, let's start with texture painting and I will add Let's see, a monkey mesh, the trusty Suzanne, great for demonstrational purposes. And I will go ahead and smooth the shading and also add a subdivision surface modifier. Let's crank it up to level two. And uh, let's say I wanted to paint Suzanne in like a leopard skin uh, spotted pattern. So uh, to paint the texture, I first need to lay out the UVs. So I'll split my window, make this left window the UV image editor and then uh, tab into edit mode on my object and with all my um, mesh elements selected I'll click the U hotkey and uh, we'll choose smart UV project just to give us something to work with and the default settings are fine and uh, then in the UV image editor let's click the image button new image so we have something to paint on I'll name it paint and then as far as the dimensions we'll make it a 2k map so 2048 by 2048 and for the color since it's leopard spots let's choose a more appropriate um, light brownish gold kind of color I think that'll be fine click OK and we can see that our UVs are now on top of the image texture we just created uh, jump back to object mode and then uh, let's go to texture paint and we can minimize our UV image editor off to the side and here we can see the color from the image texture we created and so um, if I wanted to start painting this in leopard spots, let's see, I'll choose the viewport uh, texture shading mode because that will show just the solid color. And uh, for the spots, I would first color pick um, this gold color, make it a little bit darker, and then I can start painting some spots. But um, I need to go over some texture paint settings real quick. So if we scroll down here, now the new default in Blender 2.67 is uh, project paint is the only way to, to uh, paint on a 3D model in Blender. Whereas before this version, project paint was enabled with a checkbox allowing us to turn it off and paint with the older style of uh, 3D painting. But we can no longer do that in 2.67. We only have the option for project paint. Hopefully this changes because there were um, specific uses for the older method. But anyway, uh, some settings here. Um, I have occlude, cull, and normal turned on. I think they're on by default. And uh, occlude and cull pretty much do the same thing um, in different ways. They calculate it differently. Um, occlude is apparently a more accurate way, but it's also slower. And cull is slightly faster, but perhaps not as accurate. Uh, it doesn't really matter for this demonstration, so I'll turn off occlude and leave on cull. And the normal setting, what it does, is uh, as I make a stroke all the way across the model you'll notice that it gets lighter and darker in certain areas so where it's lighter that means that the uh, surface is facing away from the camera or from the angle that we are viewing the surface at and where it gets darker that means that um, the surface is facing directly at us so this uh, has its uses but I don't need it on right now so I'll turn it off and undo that paint stroke and go back to painting and uh, let's see right away we see another problem and this is due to the bleed uh, value we have right here which is set to zero and if I zoom in here to the UV image editor where I um, just uh, made that spot in our texture let's see look at the other one okay um, with the bleed value set to zero the paint stroke um, because what's happening here is as I make the stroke in 3d it has to translate that to the 2d image and when it translates it um, the setting uh, the bleed setting at zero means the paint stroke will not extend beyond the um, UV island and it's not perfectly precise so when it doesn't extend beyond it um, there's potential for getting these lines uh, revealing your UV seams so let's change that bleed value up to about five and this is in pixels so this allows the paint stroke to bleed beyond the UV island five pixels and now when I paint over that same spot we no longer see the UV seam 
All right, so back to um, leopard spots. Uh, anyway, so uh, I'm just going to continue painting um, a few spots around here. And uh, this is um, not the highest quality, it's just for demonstration. But uh, after that first layer, I would then make it darker and then kind of outline. Let's switch to my pen, kind of outline these spots. And there we go, we have some leopard spots. But hopefully you notice a couple things about it right away. Number one is the quality isn't very good. And also, um, it's not very fast. Um, it would be much easier if we could just take a picture of leopard spots and paint that texture all over the model. And that's exactly what we can do with brush textures. So uh, first, let's find an image. Um, I'll jump over to my browser. And I like to use Creative Commons images. So the best search engine, in my opinion, for that is um, search.creativecommons.org. And uh, it's just a search engine that uses other search engines, but the big difference is it filters all the results to be used for Creative Commons. Uh, up here, I want something that I can, number one, use for commercial purposes, number two, modify, adapt, and build upon. I want those two checked. And now I can type in, let's say, leopard spots. And uh, if I click on any of these search engines, we have Flickr, which is the default, I believe, for images. And I like to start there because I think it gives the best results, but it has Photopedia, Google, uh, Google Images, YouTube for videos, CC Mixer for music. Anyway, this is a great search engine for Creative Commons media. So I'll click Flickr, and we're taken to the Flickr website, um, seeing that only Creative Commons licensed content is being shown. So right away, the first image is pretty awesome. Um, that's kind of exactly what I'm looking for. But uh, we get all kinds of images. If I keep scrolling down, this one might work pretty well. There's just um, several, several options to choose from. So I really like this search engine. But uh, this first image will work great. So I'll click on it. And then right click over the image to see uh, the sizes. And ideally, you'll have some larger photos uh, available to you. So we'll just choose the large option, which is usually a 1024 size map. And then I will save the image. Let's call it uh, leopard spots underscore raw. So we've got that image saved. We'll jump back over to Blender. And to set up a brush texture, uh, if we scroll down, we see the texture drop down. And this is where we add them. Um, and these can be added to any brush. But um, I like to keep them specific to one brush just to keep them a bit more organized. So let's create a new brush here, brush.002, and I will rename it stamp. And then scroll down and in the texture drop down, let's click new texture. And it'll create a default texture for us uh, with the clouds texture type. So let's rename it to leopard spots raw to correspond uh, with the file that we saved. And uh, in order to access the settings for this texture, now we can't find them over here, or rather there are settings, but they're different settings than what you may be used to with standard textures. Uh, so we can edit those in the uh, texture panel. And uh, notice that I'm using the Blender internal engine up here, not cycles, where the UI gives us the option over here um, in the texture panel. Uh, there's a little brush icon, and this gives us access to all the brush textures, whereas Let's see, if I create uh, just a random material, um, now we also have the option for um, textures that belong to materials. So that's how it looks uh, in the Blender internal engine. Uh, if we go to Cycles, it's a little bit different. It's a drop down instead of the small icons, but um, here we can see it's a brush texture, uh, leopard spots raw. And it doesn't seem to show uh, the material textures because there aren't any. So uh, for the type, we'll choose image or movie. We'll go uh, find that texture that we just saved. And now we can see that that's popped up over here in the brush texture uh, UI. So if we just start painting in our uh, viewport, we uh, don't seem to be getting anything. I will go ahead and switch over to my uh, pen instead of the mouse. And let's turn the strength up to one. 
still not getting anything. And that's uh, because we are in the Cycles uh, engine. So we can mess with the uh, brush texture settings in Cycles, but um, I guess at this point we can't actually paint the texture. So if we jump back to Blender Render, now when we paint, we see the texture being laid down. But um, you'll notice that it's extremely dark, and that's because uh, the color I have set to a dark brown. So when we're painting with a brush texture, if we want the true color from the image, we need to turn um, the color of our brush all the way to white. So let me turn my saturation all the way down to zero. And now when I uh, paint the texture, it will match exactly the image that we have loaded. So this is cool. Um, let's see, you should notice right away that the image is being tiled and that um, leads us into some of the settings for um, brush textures. And right below the image, we see brush mapping. By default, it's set to tiled. And what this does is simply tile the image all the way across our viewport. And as we paint, it simply projects that tiled texture onto the model. And I think we can see this uh, at the bottom of the texture dropdown, we have this overlay option. So let's click the eye. And then as I hover in the 3D view, you can see exactly what this is doing. And it's the image just tiled across the viewport. So let's take a look at our other brush mapping uh, styles. And starting at the top is stencil. Um, this is cool because it uh, takes the image and gives you sort of a widget of the image to be used. And the hotkeys for um, moving this image around is centered around your right click. So just right clicking and moving will uh, simply translate the image around. Control right clicking will rotate the image and shift right clicking will scale the image up and down. So this is a really uh, useful brush mapping type because I can scale, rotate, translate the image exactly how I want. And then as I paint in the image, it basically projects that onto the surface. So that's uh, really cool. This allows us to paint more seamlessly so we don't see that um, annoying tiling um, that we see so obviously uh, with the tiled brush type. So uh, stenciled is really cool. Let's see what else we have. Random, that's exactly what it sounds like. It's just random. The 3D mode sort of projects the texture um, in, in world space onto the model, similar to the um, default uh, generated UV coordinates um, that you get when you uh, apply a texture in a material. So let's just paint that. And it's, you know, it's much bigger, but it's projected from the world onto the model. So that one's not too bad for uh, uh, covering Suzanne here in leopard spots, but um, we will start to see some stretching here. The image appears to be projected from the um, Y axis of the world. So um, that's not a perfect solution. Let's see, we've seen tiled already and view plane works very similarly to a stamp. So uh, it doesn't work really well um, with a brush where I click and make a stroke because it continues to repeat that image over and over and over again. And it just ends up looking a little bit weird and repetitive. But if I switch over to my mouse, now I can just make single clicks and it works exactly like a stamp. And that actually, um, that works pretty well. It is the exact same um, portion of the texture, so it may look uh, repetitive. But um, yeah, that functions just like a stamp. So those work great, but um, let's say my goal was to simply cover Suzanne in an even uh, leopard spot pattern. As the image is now, it's not the best to make that happen. The closest we came was with the 3D mode. Let's see, I will turn off pressure sensitivity on the strength so it just paints full all the time. So that's basically what I want to do. That's the effect that I want, but I don't ever want to see um, UV seams. And I also don't want stretching at certain angles. And the answer for this is to make the texture tileable. That way I can use the tiled uh, brush mapping type and can go to town painting this pattern evenly all across uh, Suzanne's surface. So let's jump over to Photoshop and make this thing tileable. I want to open up our image texture. Let's see, leopard spots raw. 
And um, to make this thing tileable, um, it needs to be of square dimensions. So with my um, crop tool, let's drag out a selection. And if I hold shift, it keeps it um, in square dimensions. So we'll drag it out to about that size, maybe a little bit smaller. Again, holding shift will keep the same dimensions as I scale down. And um, let's see, I want to find a section in this texture um, that's most similar, where there isn't a lot of variance in color or value. So I think this upper corner might do well. Let's select it, and the only thing I have to worry about is, um, let's see, in this bottom left corner, you can see that the uh, hue is a little bit more saturated, a little bit more brown, and also a little bit darker. So let's fix that um, with my dodge tool first. Let's grab my uh, pen, and uh, I just want to lightly um, brighten up these uh, areas in the uh, bottom left portion of the uh, image. I think that's pretty good, but the uh, dodge tool will also um, increase the saturation, so I want to choose then the sponge tool. And this will allow me to take out some color. And there we go. I, uh, I think that all matches now as far as hue and value. So next, let's figure out the dimensions of the image. If I hit Alt-Command-I or Alt-Control-I if you're on a PC, we can see that the image size is 483 by 483. And uh, I want to be able to divide this in two, so I'll go ahead and make the dimensions 480 by 480 by cubic sharper uh, anytime I'm scaling down personally. Click OK. Shouldn't see much difference. It was a very small scale. And then uh, let's go to filter and choose other uh, offset here. And um, I want to make the horizontal and vertical offset of the image exactly half of the dimension. So it was 480. That means 240 and 240. Uh, and this shows us exactly what the image would look like tiled, where it's very obviously not matching up, just like we saw with the tiled brush mapping um, of our image texture in Blender. So with this offset, I can simply paint out the seam here, and then the image will be tileable. So let's grab the clone brush, and then let's uh, pick a source location. Let's go to the bottom right corner, Alt, click to uh, make that uh, source selection. And uh, let's start painting out this seam. Pick a different source location, continue painting it out. Basically, I want to source various parts of this image so that it doesn't look um, repetitious. And I think that looks pretty good for the horizontal seam. Now let's uh, go vertical. keeping in mind that I want to stay away from the edges completely. I never want to touch the edges because I know these edges match up with one another. So avoid um, touching those. And yeah, that should be good for this uh, demonstration. Now if I hit Command F or Control F if you're on a PC, um, that will repeat the filter, the offset filter, and uh, I can keep pressing that over and over again, and we shouldn't see any um, tiling seams, which we don't, so that's perfect. I can save out either version, it doesn't matter, but let's go to File, Save As, uh, JPEG will be fine, and let's call it Leopard Spots Tiled. And jumping back to Blender, I will create a new texture, let's call it uh, Leopard Spots Tiled. Then go find the image that we just saved, first changing the texture type from clouds to image. Click open and choose our tiled image. There we go. Now with the tiled type, I can simply paint in the viewport and uh, no matter the angle, we won't see any seams or stretching. Let's turn off the overlay. Well, we do see some stretching because uh, I'm projecting the texture, so I'll have to change angles and then paint um, at the various different angles. But uh, as you can see, no matter the angle that I make my paint stroke, the spots blend seamlessly. So uh, if you can find tileable brush textures, that can be a huge benefit to your uh, texture painting workflow. Now uh, let's take a look at how brush textures are useful when sculpting. 
So uh, we'll just stick with this uh, leopard spots texture for now. And uh, we'll jump out of texture paint mode. I'll change the viewport shading back to solid. And uh, let's see, we'll need a lot of geometry uh, when sculpting because if our mesh isn't dense, there's no geometry to react to the texture. So let's add, um, I'll turn off the subsurface modifier and let's add a multi-resolution modifier. And let's subdivide, let's say four times and then jump into sculpt mode. Uh, now, just like in texture paint mode, I like to have a specific brush designated as the stamping brush. And I already have one, just a duplicate of the regular brush, and I've renamed it Stamp. And uh, we can see that our uh, Leopard Spots texture is already plugged up. So let's just try um, sculpting on the surface and see what we get. So it is understanding the texture because we're getting all these uh, jagged extrusions, but um, we have no idea that this is a leopard spot texture. So let's undo that and for one, um, lessen the intensity of the brush significantly. And uh, also I will go ahead and subdivide two more times to level six, which is um, very dense. You can see that Blender is um, struggling to keep up with that much geometry. It looks like we're at about two million faces. But now if I make a stroke on the surface, uh, you should be able to see um, how this uh, correlates to the texture. Now when it comes to sculpting, the hue and saturation of the image doesn't matter, only the value of the pixels. So whichever pixels are darker, um, the brush will affect that area less, and if the uh, pixels are brighter, higher in value, the brush will affect it more. So you can see in here um, the lower areas, uh, that's where the black is in our image, the black of our spots, and the raised areas are the uh, lighter valued pixels. So even though you can use colored images, that's fine. If you're making a specific um, sculpting brush texture library, um, it makes a lot of sense to just keep it black and white. And if you come from other software, namely the most popular sculpting software, ZBrush, they call these textures alphas, which is the channel that's only black and white. But uh, in this specific example, leopard spots uh, don't really make sense uh, to use as a brush texture when sculpting. Instead, I want to use a more practical example. So I'll get rid of uh, the multi-resolution modifier, uh, jump back into object mode, and might as well get rid of uh, Suzanne. And I will add uh, just a simple mesh cube. And let's see, move that up one grid unit to be even with the grid floor. Then uh, let's see, tab into edit mode and I'll subdivide it a couple times. Add a subdivision surface modifier and uh, let's apply that. So we have this kind of uh, smoothed cube. And uh, my first inclination, uh, just like I did with the uh, texture painting, is to go to my browser and search uh, for a more practical image, something I would use during sculpting. And uh, a good example is like a screw head. So um, let's go back to the Creative Commons search. And instead of leopard spots, let's type uh, Phillips head screw. And uh, yeah, this third image is uh, perfect, exactly what I want. Um, it's pretty much head on with the screw. I don't want to screw at an angle, but I want it facing the camera, which is perfect. And I've already saved this image out. So let's jump back over to Blender and jump into sculpt mode uh, here. And uh, let's add a new texture to my stamp brush. I'll call it screw photo. And let's open the image that I saved. Let's see, image, open. And as you can see, I went ahead and desaturated the photograph and also removed the um, wood that the screw was sitting in and replaced it with 50% gray because uh, when it comes to these um, brush textures for sculpting, the value has to be closer to black or closer to white. If it's right in the middle, then it will have no effect. So to see this, uh, instead of multi-resolution, I'm going to go down to the topology tab and enable dynamic topology. That way I can have isolated high density areas in my mesh. And uh, so that's enabled. The detail size I will change to five, which is um, very detailed. And uh, let's see, let's get in close. 
as I change the size of my brush, you can see the uh, texture overlaid very nicely in the brush icon. And uh, let's make a stroke on the surface. And uh, let's see, in the brush mapping, I'm using tiled right now. So let's change that to view plane because we know that that works um, like a stamp. But, uh, well, let's try it again. How about we increase the strength significantly? There we go. I, I want it to work by clicking one time and the stamp is laid down. Um, and uh, so there we go. The problem here, and the problem a lot of times when using photographs for sculpt mode brush textures, is uh, if we look closely at the texture over here, there's all kinds of little specks and uh, dark values, light values, dents and dings that unfortunately show up a lot uh, when I actually stamp the geometry. And this really doesn't look like a screw at all. So instead of using a photograph, I want to show you how you can quickly model a screw and render it out to give you a very accurate um, white to black image texture that will define the high and low areas exactly how we want it for a sculpting brush texture. So let's go to um, layer number two and uh, I will quickly model out a screw very simply. Let's add a circle. Uh, tab into edit mode, extrude, scale out, and then um, extrude again, scale it inward, and also push it down. This is the hole that the screw will be sitting in. Then let's add some very, very tight holding edges. And now um, select these two edge loops. Um, Shift D to duplicate the faces. Scale down slightly and then move it down so that it kind of lines up with the surface, this other surface that we made. Uh, now select the outer edge loop, hit E to extrude it, scale it inward, and uh, here I want to give it kind of a dome to the screw. You see that a lot um, in screws. So we will add that here, and uh, let's use median point instead of my 3D cursor as my pivot point. Hit E one last time, Alt-M, uh, merge at the center to cap off our dome. There we go. Let's add another crisp holding edge. So um, here's the surface, and then here is our screw. Now let's uh, add a subdivision surface modifier. And I want to increase the subdivisions where currently the mesh is uh, solid shaded or flat shaded, I mean. Instead of smooth, I want to keep it flat and subdivide enough times to where it looks smooth. So that looks to be about four. Let's apply it and I'll explain why I'm doing this in just a moment. Uh, now let's add the Phillips head indentation in the top of the screw. Shift A mesh cube. Tab into edit mode and let's scale this guy down, make him skinny and position him as a boolean for this uh, screw mesh. That looks good. Select everything, Shift D, rotate in the Z direction 90 degrees. Now uh, back in edit mode, let's subdivide a few times. Where is it at? Subdivide. Then add a subdivision surface modifier. Crank it up to two maybe three, that's good. Apply it, and I will rename this mesh object to be B-O-O-L, because this will be my Boolean object. I select my other mesh, add a Boolean modifier, and for the object, let's pick that Boolean object. And then uh, let's take a look to see if that's what we want. Doesn't look like it. How about we uh, change the operation to difference? And no, that's not it either. How about union? And no, that's not it. Let's see, something is wrong. Let's try turning off double-sided in the object data panel. Let's turn that off. Okay, so I need to flip some normals around. What about this guy, turning off double-sided? I think that's the problem. Let's flip those normals around. 
Now let's uh, turn on our Boolean modifier again and uh, change the operation to intersect. Uh, how about difference? Yeah, I think that's what I want. Let's apply that. Get rid of our Boolean object. We have a very nice screw model here. Oh, and uh, the reason I wanted to keep my geometry with flat shaded normals is because uh, if they were smooth, uh, we would see a very jagged edge where the Boolean took place. All right, great. So how do we get uh, the black and white brush texture out of this? Well, we want to do a render. So let's add a camera. Let's uh, clear the rotations uh, so that it's uh, looking straight down with Alt-R is how I clear those rotations. Uh, now let's move the camera up, then hit zero on our number pad to look into the camera. And uh, let's zoom out. There we go. And because this render is for texture, let's change our resolution to be, let's go 1024 by 1024, 100%. Then in the end panel, let's turn on lock camera to view. So I can position the screw in the middle of the frame. Turn that off. Yeah, I think that looks pretty good. And uh, before I click render, let's go to our um, render layer and passes settings. Open up the passes drop down, and by default in Blender Render, this um, Z depth channel should be turned on. Make sure that is on. That's the only pass that we need and then click render, render image. And uh, it should look like nothing because the image is saving depth information, not necessarily um, pixel color information. And uh, we can check the depth information down here. We have uh, four toggles. First is the image with the alpha cutout, then the image without the alpha cutout, just the alpha channel, and finally the depth channel. Yet, uh, even with this turned on, we don't see anything. It's just white, or so it appears. But if we hold control, um, right click and hold down over the image and move around the image, I want you to look in the bottom left corner, there's a bunch of numbers lined up. Um, but look at the X, Y, and Z value specifically. The Z is the one that we want to pay attention to. Because as I move it, you can see that that number is changing. And that means that there is depth information we just need to convert it to RGB values. So to do that, we'll jump over to the node editor and uh, let's see, with compositing nodes selected, that's the far left button that looks like two pictures. Let's turn on use nodes and uh, a render layers node will pop up as well as the composite node. That's uh, exactly what we need to start out with. And uh, we have our image alpha and Z depth channels over here. Let's drag the Z into the composite node it uh, still shows up white because um, it's just depth information. So to convert this, I will hit Shift A, Vector, and uh, Normalize. As soon as that's plugged up, we see a black and white image of the screw that we modeled. But it's perhaps a little bit backwards because um, the actual Phillips head indentation should be black because uh, in sculpt mode, remember the black values in the texture will not be affected, but the white values will be increased. So we want to invert these colors. Shift A, color, invert. Plug that in between the normalize and the composite node. And there we go. We've got a very accurate black and white representation of a screw. So uh, I'll hit render again. And uh, be sure to change from the Z-depth value filter to the um, normal RGB channels, one of the uh, left two view modes. And uh, we can save this out as an image now. Save as, Philip Screw is a fine name. And uh, we'll just leave it as PNG, uh, RGB, and compression all the way up to 100%. Uh, with sculpting brush textures, I like to use PNG because in Blender, JPEGs really show their compression artifacts. Uh, PNGs are a little bit clearer. So let's save that guy out. Jump back into the 3D view. Let's go to layer one, where we have our little cube here. Jump back into sculpt mode on the cube, and let's switch out uh, this image that's associated with our screw brush texture. Let's switch that out for phillipsscrew.png. There we go. And let's see if that doesn't give us a better screw stamp. 
Well, I need a little bit more geometry than that. Enable dynamic, uh, detail size at five. Let's click again. And yeah, that looks much better. Now it's uh, very simple to add all kinds of screws over something mechanical that you might be uh, sculpting. So let's uh, go ahead and increase our detail size or decrease it to, let's go to a value of two and add a screw, add another one all the way um, across this top edge. Though I am noticing a slight lip around our uh, screw that's kind of uh, detracting from the screw feel of it. So a way that we can fix that is this sample bias setting we have over here in the tool panel. So earlier when I told you that 50% uh, gray, a value of 0.5, doesn't have any effect when sculpting, that's actually not true by default because the default setting here is zero. And what that means is that a value of zero or black doesn't have any effect on the mesh. So in order to make 0.5 have no effect on the mesh, which is what I want, I need to change the sample bias to negative 0.5. Now when I add a screw, we don't really get that lip anymore. Um, however, the uh, view plane brush mapping type is not working great for this screw because it's stamping at an angle. So if we want the same stamping effect, but we want it to respect the angle of the surface, we need to choose uh, area plane. Now it doesn't matter where I click on the surface, um, each new screw will respect the surface direction. So this can be um, a whole lot of fun. I could probably uh, lay screws down on this uh, cube all day long. But uh, yeah, that's how you can use brush textures to improve your texture painting and sculpting workflows. Thanks for watching.